Bien. Uh, good morning and welcome amongst us. Thank you for coming to be with us this morning. It's uh, very cold out today. We're honored today to have with us and to be able to share with viewers of CPAC a tremendous friend of Canada, a tremendous friend of IDRC, a truly great African. We are winding up the celebration of the 40th anniversary of IDRC. We sought to bring to Canada a number of very distinguished speakers of renown. We had been after Minister Manuel for quite some time to join us. He clearly wanted to, but his schedule is such that he had great difficulty finding the window to do it. But as the year was drawing to a close, he still had us in mind, and he, he made the very long trip uh, in order to be with us today. Uh, we'll be meeting with parliamentarians later in the day, and there will be a number of events in connection uh, with his visit, including uh, recognition um, by the House of Commons later today. Um, Trevor is an extraordinary man. He was an activist as a young man. When you read his CV, most of it is about things he did before he was a minister. And they were quite varied, and they were tremendously brave for the time in South Africa when he was agitating, and of course he paid a price for it. Everybody who was agitating did. So he was arrested, he was detained, he was banned, he was uh, subjected to uh, all of the techniques uh, of repressive regimes, but he was not successfully repressed, nor were his colleagues in the ANC. Um, some of you may know that uh, IDRC had um, an unusual and for us a very special relationship with the ANC, uh, sensing that uh, the order would change in South Africa, but years before that actually happened, uh, predecessors of ours at uh, IDRC uh, reached out to friends in the ANC to see what research on policy issues might be useful to them as they prepared to govern. What was it they felt could be of use to a future um, free South Africa? And so on a very modest scale, I should say, compared to the type of assistance that was offered to independent South Africa um, after um, the end of apartheid. Uh, IDRC had the privilege of working with uh, Minister Manuel with a number of his colleagues at the time. Uh, and it's one of the episodes in IDRC's institutional development we're most uh, proud of. I won't bang on about uh, Trevor's CV. Uh, you all know from the invitation that uh, he was minister after having been uh, minister of uh, trade and industry of his country. He was for 13 years minister of finance. 13 years is a tremendously long run in any portfolio, but in finance uh, it's quite exceptional. And during those years, he wasn't just a dominant figure in Africa and in his own country. He was a dominant figure at the international financial institutions in Washington, where he led uh, several important processes that led to uh, evolving thinking and actually institutional change in uh, both of them. Uh, today, he's a minister um, in the presidency uh, responsible for planning. He chose today, I wondered what he was going to choose to speak about. He chose to speak about social justice, equity, and governance in a rapidly changing world. And he's looking forward to the exchange with all of you in the room and any who come to us online. Trevor, over to you.
Thank you very much, David. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies. Firstly, let me express my appreciation to the IDRC for the long relationship we've had uh, and, and share with you just how humbled I am by the opportunity to participate, uh, albeit late in the day, in the very important 40th anniversary celebrations of the IDRC. <clears throat> uh, in the last 20 years, certainly, uh, we've collaborated very closely with the IDRC, and it probably started uh, with the visit of Nelson Mandela to Ottawa in 1990. And I can well imagine him saying to Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, or oh, my Prime Minister, we need to govern my country. You know, these young chaps have just come out of jail in the bush. They know nothing. You've got to help us. <laughs> and uh, I think that, uh, like so many other people in the world, uh, Prime Minister Mulroney was very persuaded by Madiba's charm uh, and immediately sent out a mission comprising professors Jerry Alini and John Loxton. Uh, and they were joined by um, uh, Dr. Benno Ndulo, who currently is uh, governor of the Central Bank in Tanzania. And uh, uh, there was a young man in, in the IDRC, Mark Van Ameringen, who was then asked to coordinate the mission. And that was the start of this wonderful relationship. But it's, it's been a relationship of exchange, but it's also been a relationship where <coughs> Uh, close friendships were developed, and I'd like to pause and just recognize one of these close friends who worked with us for six years. He was one who came with a fair amount of experience. He was a teacher, uh, great guide. Uh, he helped us navigate what was probably one of the most difficult issues in transition, the transfer of responsibilities in the public service. It wasn't so much about the Constitution. It wasn't about who would sit in Parliament. It was about the public service. And he was there and helped us navigate it. And uh, I'm saddened by the fact that Al Johnson was buried last Friday. He was a wonderful Canadian who shared with us over all of those years. And I want to uh, use this opportunity today to pr pay tribute to the remarkable role that Al had played in guiding us through what was clearly a great learning experience for all of us in South Africa. <clears throat> the relationship between the IDRC and uh, South Africa, I'm saying, had as, as, as one of its main planks the macroeconomic research group, which I was privileged to chair, and it was an initiative that, that arose from that first visit of Jerry Alain and John Loxton. <clears throat> and when we launched the initiative formally in November of 1991, Nelson Mandela, speaking at the launch, said, and I quote, the systemic, sorry, the systematic exclusion of the democratic movement from the arena of policy formulation significantly weakened its ability to formulate policies. There's therefore a need to increase the capacity of the African National Congress and the entire democratic movement in the field of economics. Initiatives are required involving economic policy research, training in economic um, policy options, and, 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 and uh, training in communication of, of economics. Conscious of this problem, we realize that it will be necessary to call on assistance from our international supporters. That's my visit to Canada last year. During my visit, I asked Prime Minister Brian Mulroney to help us strengthen our capacity for economic research and policy formulation. As I said earlier, that was the genesis, and it is something that Nelson Mandela had publicly recognized. Along the line, we learned many things about policy. One of the great bits of recall I have is uh, having been invited to an IDRC workshop at the Indian Statistical Institute. 
It was very interesting because of the countries that were invited to participate. The question before these economists was how you deal with price surges in the economy. And so India, South Korea, Chile, South Africa, Canada, of course, uh, and perhaps some Australians participated in this. Now, the interesting point about it is that if you look at the foresight demonstrated by the IDRC then in 1992, and you look at countries who performed better during the last Great Recession, it demonstrates that the IDRC certainly saw something that the rest of the world didn't. It's a pity that the rest of the countries weren't invited to that important <laughs> workshop. The premise on which the IDRC supported the ANC, and bear in mind that, as, as uh, you heard earlier, um, it was a risk because, uh, you know, the ANC was still sort of emerging from exile and from prison and stuff. We weren't in government. But the premise was one that was strongly based on social solidarity. It understood. It understood, and, and Prime Minister Brian Mulroney clearly understood that apartheid would end, that there would need to be a new government, that it needed to be supported. And that social solidarity is, in fact, from what I've seen, exactly the same premise that the IDRC uses in selecting the policy areas that it will support in different parts of the world. It needs to continue. It needs to continue because so much remains to be done. Because social solidarity is actually about a fairer, more just, and more equitable world. And if we look at the period the more recent period, clearly there have been very big and important issues of change. And amongst those issues are that which we've observed in countries like India and China that have demonstrated the remarkable ability to lift hundreds of millions out of poverty. But if you visit India and China now, speak to policymakers, they will ask you not to reflect on the people who've been lifted out of poverty, but to focus rather on those who remain in poverty. And I think that if we look at the general support that has gone to Africa, we've also demonstrated that the past decade has been the most remarkable in more than 50 years, where as a consequence of very tough decisions, there have been significant gains in economic output, substantially high enrollment numbers in school education, far more countries that are now democratic, that have democratic elections and subject uh, themselves to, or subject government to the will of the people. And even in areas such as HIV and AIDS, progress is being made. In my own country, South Africa, where we have a high number of people who are living with HIV, we think that the corner has been turned in respect of the infection rates. And all of this is enormously positive for the world going forward. But despite these gains, we've not seen the quantum leap in human development in Africa that we know is both possible and realistic. I want to offer perhaps one of the reasons why I think we aren't able to capture it and I turn to a very useful piece of work done by the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen. <clears throat> a book called Identity and Violence, where he writes, and I, I quote, there are many difficult problems to be faced 
in working for a fairer economic and social arrangement in the world. There's, for example, considerable evidence that global capitalism is typically much more concerned with markets than with, say, establishing democracy or expanding public education or enhancing social opportunities of the underdogs of society. Multinational firms can also exert substantial influence on the priorities of public expenditure in many third world countries in the direction of giving preference to the convenience of the managerial classes and privileged workers over the removal of widespread illiteracy, medical deprivation, and other handicaps of the poor." Unquote. So yes, markets work. And they've played a considerably important role in reducing poverty and inequality. But it's important that we remind ourselves that there are limitations to what markets can do. There's a continuing need to intervene on behalf of the poor and the powerless. It's ultimately what government's about. Very interesting debates about what ought to be rights and what are mere commodities. I look at differences between Canada and your southern neighbors in respect of health care, for instance. I know that there's an ongoing debate about how much healthcare should be public and how much private. But I think that, that the, one of the issues right at the center, even of that debate, is whether healthcare should ever just be a commodity for those who can afford it. And so in understanding the role of markets in the state, it's quite important that we remind ourselves of what Amartya Sen describes when he talks about the issues of what the market can and can't do. Because if we expect it to be all powerful and all capable, I think we will have a continuing growth of global inequality and inequality within countries. And it's very important that we take a view on that. But I don't want to debate market solutions versus state solutions. I'm trying to locate the developments in the world in a slightly wider context. And, and of course, as an African, African development is fundamentally important. There's something wrong with a world incapable of adhering to its commitments. The developed world had made commitments after commitment after commitment to support development in poor regions of the world. The tragedy is that very few of these commitments have been adhered to. You know, it was in 1969, in the first year after Lester Pearson was prime minister, that he headed a commission for the United Nations, where in the General Assembly there was an agreement that industrialized countries should commit 0.7% of their GDP to development in the world. 1969. And all over the world, the battle continues. There are five countries that have met that commitment. Sweden, Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, and uh, sorry, it's no, it's not the UK. It's uh, it's a small uh, eh? Luxembourg. Sorry, <laughs> but you know, since then these these issues have arisen at various times. In 2002, in Montreux, the issue was revisited. In 2005, in Glen Eagles, the commitments were even more strongly made. A fortnight ago, when the G20 heads of state and government met in Seoul, they agreed what was called the Seoul Development Consensus for Shared Growth 
where they, once again they expanded on the theme and they, they start that consensus with a very important but perhaps self-evident point that for prosperity to be sustained, it must be shared. So none of this is new. I look at this room and uh, half of us weren't even quite born when Lester Pearson made the commitment on behalf of the world. The problem is that we operate in an environment where the electorate would not allow the elected leaders in government to make commitments that they have no intention of meeting. But when heads of state and government convene, as they do across the world, they frequently make commitments that they actually have no intention <laughs> of delivering on. And so there has to be quite a fundamental problem in the way in which decisions are taken in the global arena. You see, Africa's development matters a great extent. And because heads of state and government have recognized this at so many crucial moments, certainly in the past two decades, the fact that they don't deliver it uh, on it exists as a blot on their collective copybook. I want to turn to Amartya Sen again from that book. Actually, it's one of his lesser known books. Uh, I saw, David, that you've got uh, the idea of justice lying on your coffee table. That, together with development as freedom, are, are his two better known books. But in Identity and Violence, he talks about Africa. And this is what he says. He says, the neglect of the plight of Africa today can have a long-run effect on world peace in the future. What the rest of the world, especially the rich world, did or did not do when at least a quarter of the African population seemed to be threatened with extinction through pandemics involving AIDS, malaria, and other maladies might not be forgotten for a very long time to come. We have to understand more clearly our poverty, deprivation and neglect and the humiliation associated with the asymmetry of power relate over long periods to a proneness to violence linked with confrontations that drawn grievances against the top dogs in a world of divided identities, unquote. Now, <clears throat> I think Amartya in writing this was writing to something that he understood, that world leaders shared because if they didn't share this premise, then they wouldn't have made the kind of commitments to Africa that they periodically did. But it is important to remind ourselves that the neglect to meet these obligations is actually creating a cleavage in the way in which world development takes place. Now, Canada. You see, Canada didn't just make vague statements about opposing apartheid. Brian Mulroney, as a conservative prime minister, broke ranks with some of his friends in the Commonwealth and elsewhere to recognize just how bad apartheid was and took a very strong stand against it. And I think it spoke to the spirit of a Canadian sense of fairness and justice. But Canada has also been one of the countries that constantly has put Africa's development on the agenda. So in 2002, when the G8 met in Kananaskis, it was no surprise that African development was one of the centerpieces of the Kananaskis, the Kananaskis Declaration. And this is, this is what that declaration said in 2002. The case for action is compelling. Despite its great potential and human resources, 
Africa continues to face some of the world's greatest challenges. The many initiatives designed to spur Africa's development have failed to deliver sustained improvements to the lives of individual women, men, and children throughout Africa. The new Partnership for Africa's Development offers something different. It is first and foremost a pledge by African leaders to the people of Africa to consolidate democracy and sound economic management and to promote peace, security, and people-centered development." Unquote. Strong and unequivocal. There can't be any second guessing the intentions of the heads of state who appended their signature to that Kananaskis declaration. Now, earlier that year, in Montreux, there was the accord, and perhaps uh, the, the Montreux consensus arose in very particular circumstances. It was the first global meeting after the events of 9-11. But the heads of state who gathered there made a very strong commitment to a partnership between North and, and South, between rich and poor, a partnership and a consensus arrangement that would begin to shift. Now, there are just a few months between the Monterey consensus and the Kananaskis Declaration. But what is in the air is clearly an understanding that if you want change, then you have to go the route of partnership. Now, almost a decade la later, we can recognize the fact that uh, the equity that was strived for, that was recognized uh, as, as essential, has not been delivered. And on some of the issues that might appear very compelling, the world, has, the world leaders have enormous difficulty in dealing with. You know, in the G20, it's very hard to get leaders to agree that the words global and imbalances can follow each other in the same <laughs> sentence. <laughs> so it has to be something else. It's not, what we're seeing in the world is, is, is not a consequence of imbalances between rich and poor, between countries with huge surpluses and countries with huge deficits. It's not about any of that. There's, there's something else that causes what the world is living through right now. I know that uh, the crafting of communiques is an, is an art form not appreciated by many, but uh, <laughs> within that art form, putting these two words, one after the other, is quite impossible. And because of that, you don't deal with the issues. And so perhaps, again, you know, Africa was a useful diversion. And so, the heads of state there agreed, and I quote, we recognize the potential for faster growth in Africa, which could be unlocked by African plans for deeper regional integration. We therefore commit to support regional integration efforts of African leaders, including by helping to realize their vision of a free trade area th through the promotion of trade facilitation and regional infrastructure. Great. But how do we ensure that every time leaders meet, you don't then create a smorgasbord for cynics? How do you get these commitments to stick? You see, because go back, go back to Kananaskis, to that very important commitment made to the new Partnership for Africa's Development, that partnership was in fact constructed in a very particular way. You see, because the partnership said that we as African leaders will do certain things and in exchange we're looking for trade and support to make the rest of things happen. And quite important within that new partnership for Africa's development is a mechanism called the African peer review mechanism. 
Now, if you look at the APRM, it goes much further. I mean, you know, the OECD peer review is a Sunday school picnic compared to what African heads of state commit to when they sign up for the African peer review mechanism. And it's interesting. It's interesting because it requires a very deep commitment to all manner of things. And in the case of South Africa, we are told you not Liberia. You haven't just emerged from conflict. You've had a head start. We don't require of you merely what we require of Liberia. We require a series of other things. And that's there. It's a commitment that heads of state make to each other in the process. And the other thing about the African peer review mechanism is that it's also very public. Now, if you do this and you do it correctly, then what you have is a mechanism that, in the first instance, has to change the relationship between a government in an African country and its electorate. In the second instance, it changes the relationship between heads of state and countries on the African continent. And thirdly, it changes the relationship between these 53 countries on the continent, Africa as a whole, and the rest of the world. Because in the context of the symmetry that you're looking for in partnership, the commitments have been made, if not the deficits in those commitments are publicly identified, and the way in which you then construct it is to incentivize better behavior so that consistently you're dealing with improving on the quality of life of people. And when that spirit, as described in the Kananaskis Declaration, is not met, the ability to improve on governance because you're saying to some of the heads of state, you can't be lax about this. You must meet your commitments to democracy and governance. And the way in which you we will get you to do that and assist you through this is to ensure that what you identify as, as, as short shortages in budget and other ways will be dealt with so that we can consistently improve. And when the one side of the partnership falls flat, it becomes easier for people who don't want to commit themselves in the way that the APRM requires of them to perhaps hold back. I'm saying that in the context of partnership, I'm not raising these matters because it's only weakness on the part of our northern partners. Sometimes we as Africans don't meet our own obligations. But the mechanism, I think, is there. It has a huge spur to better behavior. And if you want equity, then I think it's not a bad place to start if you insist on better conduct on the part of elected leaders. Take away the spur and there actually is no reward for the risk that people sometimes have to take to improve in policy. Now, even, you see, again, the Seoul, the Seoul Declaration makes this commitment to regional integration on the continent. Our difficulty is that we have 53 different countries. 15 of them landlocked. The agreement struck in 1885 in Berlin about where the sovereign borders would be, and we live by it. Sometimes we live by it too well. We are happy that we are a sovereign state. We have an anthem and a parliament and a currency and an army and a foreign service. And but actually, if we want a place on the table, we need to sit there as one billion Africans together. And if we want to sit there as one billion Africans together with a singleness of purpose, then it becomes important that we break down these boundaries that divide us, which are actually not of our making, but of the making of the decision of colonial powers in 1885. 
Not blaming them, blaming us now. Saying we've got to take a serious view on these matters as Africans. But some things would help. You see, we all belong to, we are all shareholders in the World Bank, and so they treat each of us as a member state, a sovereign power. But our big problem is that we need to trade with each other. And if you build a road between the inside of one border point and another, then there's no way to trade with your neighbors. If you go to Google Earth and look at the map of Africa's infrastructure, it's all designed to get everything out. It's not designed to facilitate trade. It's not designed to grow the market between us. And if we want that, then we have to get across these border posts. And sometimes, because we don't collect revenue adequately, we think that we can make up by tariffs at border posts. And that's what we need to change so that the economic geography of Africa changes. That's the commitment that we have to make. But if the World Bank only lands between one point and the other, and nobody is interested in what happens across border posts, you don't actually facilitate that. There was one exception, and that again was Canada that provided some seed money to the African Development Bank to begin testing what the cross-border uh, uh, infrastructure development would look like. I was at a conference uh, this past weekend where uh, my good friend Paul Martin was also present and uh, he said, you know, Canada would have been many different countries if that railway line that linked east with west was not constructed. Why don't you do the same in Africa? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds even more rational today than what it did the weekend, but it's a very important issue. <laughs> But that's what we have to do. We have to get in, understand what the difficulties are, understand where decision-making processes are deficient, and work a way around that. See, I want to, and, and of course, I am uh, an exceedingly passionate and optimistic African. I, I have a bit of responsibility with the NEPAD and the African Development Bank, the African Union, to try and get the infrastructure stuff going. Uh, that's new and exciting, uh, and so uh, we, we're pretty familiar, and, and the detail in my head is, is quite current in the infrastructure, and I know what it can and must do. I want to move from Africa generally to talk about uh, South Africa. It's a country that I'm exceedingly privileged to serve. Served it for a long time in, in government, but uh, it remains a privilege. And it's a country that I think has enormous potential, yet from time to time frustrates even those of us who serve it. Because it doesn't always live up to potential. Out of the blocks in 1990, as we described these, these, these halkian days when uh, 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 David Mulroney and Nelson Mandela reached this agreement. This great moment, I like your Bafana Bafana scarf. I mean, even we <laughs> South Africans uh, would modestly say that we did a spectacular job in delivering a FIFA 2010 <laughs> World Cup. But then there are these issues we don't quite get right. We need to talk about them, and we need to talk about them in the context of, of Africa, and we need to continue to drive ourselves. Because of certain policy initiatives, we've come through this recession in many ways better than many countries. Our banks are strong and unscathed. At no point 
was there a threat to revenue sufficient to in any way suggest that we would have to reduce our social commitments to the poor in South Africa. But one of the things that happened in 2009 was we shed a million jobs. And this fed into what has been our greatest challenge, and that is job creation. You see, we <coughs> The failure to, to create sufficient jobs continues to cast a long shadow from the apartheid past into South Africa. Our unemployment numbers are now at 25%. And if we don't deal with that, people feel that democracy has not delivered anything in their lives, and frequently this is an intergenerational problem. And that's what we need to understand because as I do as a policymaker in South Africa, I understand what the ravages of inequality are within the country. It's not just between rich and poor countries, it's within a country. Because there are parts of our country that are very much like, like the wealthy in Canada, but there are parts of it that are desperate too large a part of South Africa remains desperately poor. And if you have such inequality, then you have enormous difficulties. There's a wonderful book written by uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate uh, Pickett called The Spirit Level. And they show consistently how inequality in society leads to higher levels of social problems. And if, if, if there's a sense of despair, especially amongst young people, then antisocial problems take root. And it's something we live with in South Africa. But we understand it from the context also of the huge inequalities that obtain. And if people sense that there's no way out, then sometimes they think that there might be a shortcut, and that is part of the difficulty. But you see, it's a sense of the interrelationship between inequality and injustice that is so pervasive in too many parts of the world. In fact, in the same book, they use a very interesting study by Robert Wade of the London School of Economics about the interrelationship between inequality in the world, or in particular countries, and the financial crash of both 1929 and 2008. Let me just share this. Uh, estimates of growing inequalities meant that in the years before 2000, the 2008 crash, about one and a half trillion US dollars per year were being siphoned from the bottom 90% of the US population to the top 10%. As a result, the richest people had more and more money to invest and lend, but people outside of the very wealthiest category found it increasingly difficult to maintain their relative incomes or realize their aspirations. Both for speculators and for ordinary householders, rising property prices made investment in property look like a bandwagon everyone had to get onto. People bought into the housing market whatever they could and remortgaged precariously as prices rose. The financial sector handling and speculating on these debts found its share of all US corporate profits rising from 15% to 40% in 2003 as the bubble grew bigger the worse its eventual and inevitable burst became, unquote. Wade's studies on, on the period leading up to 29 are no dissimilar. I'm saying that if we want justice, and it's important that we try and understand the ravages of inequality, this book, The Spirit Level, I think is a great step forward in helping us understand just what the impact of it is. I raise the nature of our challenge both in Africa and South Africa as candidly as I do because I think that a high level of consciousness about the nature of the challenges that confront us needs to be there in order for us to help address them. 
Social justice, equity, and governance are inextricably intertwined. The transfer of power in South Africa was never about a mere change at the ballot box. It has been and still remains a quest for social justice. Social justice itself may appear to elude those who, are feel, who, who might feel they are hard done by. So for us in South Africa, the struggle continues. It's a different struggle. But some elements, especially those that are focused on inclusiveness, remain dominant themes. But then we also understand that South Africa is a microcosm of the world that right now is a harsh, unequal, and seemingly unforgiving place. The theme of partnership needs to be brought back into sharper focus as we make our country, our continent, and our world a fairer, a more just, and more democratic place to live in. In ending, I want to remind us of the life that that great Al Johnson gave to helping us understand issues in South Africa. And it's also appropriate that we recognize another Johnson who passed this week, Chalmers Johnson, who's, wrote magni who's written magnificently about the risks of superpowers ignoring the ravages of inequality in the world. We've got so much information available, it calls for action, it calls for partnership, it calls for commitment, and it calls for citizens everywhere to hold the feet of their leaders to the fire to ensure that the commitments are met. Thank you very much. <coughs>
and you have another organization such as the tribunal, when you have heads of state rejecting one, how can you um, ensure that they will accept another? When you sign on to SADC, presumably you signed on to, not, I don't mean South Africa, when a country such as Zimbabwe, for example, is a signatory and has ratified SADC, de facto it accepts and ratifies the tribunal as is part of your, the SADC charter. Um, that's been a bit tricky in the last year or so. So those who might like to invest in that part of the world see uh, an economic commission, but will people adhere to it and its requirements or not? Was that clear? It seemed clear when I thought of it. Thank you. And we'll take one more, then allow Trevor to get on with those and return to the microphones thereafter. Please, sir. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Manuel, my name is, is Vernon Jawson. Um, in a, a study undertaken by the Association of, of Higher Education and De Development, it was found that Africa was losing about uh, 20,000 uh, professionals per year. Um, to overcome this um, significant brain, brain drain, the African Union has has now recognized that the African diaspora worldwide uh, is considered the sixth region of, of Africa. I want to, to, and this was to uh, counter, to, uh, to, to move from the brain drain to, to a, a brain gain, which is the words that was, was used. I wonder if you care to uh, comment on uh, mechanisms that could be be put in place which would um, ensure the uh, successful and uh, effective and efficient diaspora engagement in the socio-economic uh, development of Africa. Thank you. Um, Farouk, your question, uh, two sides. One side is uh, on the enforcement. And, and this is where I think uh, uh, we have a huge difficulty. You know, sometimes, and uh, it, it, it ties up to part of what Suzanne was raising, politics defies rationality. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to say for somebody who earns his keep from politics, but, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, take reform of the Bretton Woods institutions. It's a very interesting study. Um, you want fairer representation that is, that is a better reflection of, of, of the contribution of the world, and you want to ensure that some of the characteristics of, of, of the IMF especially as a credit union uh, would, would feature. And uh, to try and get countries to part with uh, seats that they have at the table uh, seemed almost impossible. And earlier this year, the United States uh, dropped a bombshell and they said, we won't vote for the present arrangement any, lo any longer. We have a veto unless Europe consolidates its seats at the table, uh, expect uh, uh, none of our support. And cost the US to use their veto to actually act in the interest of better a better balance because in Toronto last year, no, in Pittsburgh, uh, uh, heads of state had agreed to what must be done, but nobody wanted to do it. It's a very interesting study. But you couldn't get UN Security Council reform. Once you're in, you shut the door, <laughs> or if you're on top of the wall, you kick away the ladder. That's the problem of decision making. I'm saying that, that, that in some respects on the African continent, if we can find some mechanism to demonstrate that good conduct helps countries improve. And here, you're not, you're not, you don't actually want to place too much power in the hands of donors to play off countries and leaders against each other. But good conduct on a transparent basis should create a, you know, uh, 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 a positive uh, response. We're going to get uh, uh, much better replies. Uh, and, and, and this is why I think that initial enthusiasm, there was initially trepidation and then enthusiasm for the peer review. 
But it's pretty flat at the moment because it doesn't add up to, to, to any improvement, and that's what we've, we've got to try and get right. Suzanne, the, there are a number of issues uh, 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 within what you raised. One of them is that too many, too many countries are members of too many different institutions. Now, the WTO rules make sense. You can belong to one customs union because you can't have different external tariffs. And the fact that uh, you have overlap between Comesa and, and, and SADC is a problem. Uh, the, the Seoul Declaration talks about regional economic communities. It merely restates what, what, what is there, but you've got to order this so that uh, you can have building blocks that actually coexist without too many contradictions. For as long as you have that, there's an opt-out provision. So that's the first difficulty. The second issue is that uh, I, I, I think that uh, one of the many countries you lived in uh, in Southern Africa has actually consumed more than its fair share of time of SADC officials. I forget which one it was. <laughs> The, 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 the problem is that, that the development community that SADC is ought to be giving more attention to D in development and not D in defense. And I think the opt-out provision has actually created too much work for the political side of SADC and, and, and therefore uh, a drain on the energy of, of the development uh, that should go into place, and that, that I think is a problem. Uh, I, I happen to agree with you on the issues of the tribunal. You're trying to reach a settlement. Uh, I, I see that the Prime Minister is now, uh, in Zimbabwe, has now taken the President to court. Uh, it's, a, it's a rather interesting turn of, turn of events, but... Um, <laughs> You know, you've got to resolve those issues. You've got to resolve those issues because, you know, unfortunately, unlike what you're seeing in Ireland right now, you thought that Zimbabwe couldn't drop any further than what it was with inflation uh, at a few million percent and stuff, but somehow it's chugged along. But the lives of the poor in Zimbabwe have become uh, uh, more and more difficult. I think the elites are okay because they, they have resources and stuff. And that, I think, is the battle for democracy that must get in place. Vernon, there are a number of, 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 of aspects. Vernon's there. Oh, there you are. Uh, <laughs> there are a number of different aspects. Um, the first is how we can better mobilize the diaspora back. There's an interesting uh, study I've just seen on, on Indians in, in the United States. The United States was so happy to attract Indians uh, in, uh, they could underinvest in, in uh, skills in the United States. And as the fortunes of the US have tipped and India rises, many of those professionals have actually taken their skills and gone there, leaving huge gaping holes uh, uh, in the United States. A very interesting uh, kind of study because it speaks not of drain but circulation. Uh, um. So how you play those things out, I think, uh, requires a number of different strategies. But one of the proposals that I just heard at this conference, if nothing else, uh, Africa's need for clean energy. You know, we have this enormous potential sitting on the Congo River at Inga. Now, if we were to mobilize a diaspora bond, and Africans in the diaspora actually committed some of their savings to what could be the biggest change project for Africa. Uh, would it work? Uh, again, again, I think that it's something worth considering. So you don't necessarily need to uproot people, but you can get them to engage in development differently. Uh, and I think it's, 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 it's in our ability to, to unfold many of these ideas um, uh, and experiences that I think we'll be able to, to, to find a place and recognize the skills of Africans everywhere.
Now, Trevor, there's a question in from uh, somebody who's viewing us online, and actually it touches on a phenomenon you were mentioning just now. The essence of the question is, can the diaspora help South Africa? This is from uh, Tim Askew of the Canada Southern African Chamber of Business. So if we can come back to that in uh, when we've uh, also had an opportunity to hear from others at the microphones who have been very patient, so please. Good morning, my name is Maria Barnes. I work for APEX as a visiting executive, and APEX is the association that represents executives in the Government of Canada. I think you may need to speak louder, Okay, Sorry. let me try that again. Maria Barnes is my name. I work for APEX, which is the association that represents executives in the Government of Canada. I, I'm gonna ask you to switch gears a little bit. You referred to many challenges in your remarks, but early on you referred to um, the difficulties involved in transitioning the uh, federal public service. So I was hoping you could tell us more about that. Great. Ma'am? Hi, my name is Sonia Bell. I'm with iPolitics. It's a political and business news source. Recently back from covering your very exciting World Cup. And my question is, uh, you've characterized the relations between Canada and South Africa as very positive over the past few decades. And I'm wondering, the Brandon Huntley case, the white South African who was awarded a refugee status here, the decision was overturned yesterday. Uh, you may, uh, you are probably aware. I'm wondering uh, how that's imp how you, how has that impacted our relationships? What's the effect, and what's your reaction uh, to the judge overturning the status? Thank you, Trevor. If you agree, I think we'll take the other two questions simply to to prevent these gentlemen from standing any longer. So please, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, my name is Randall Germain. I, I teach international politics at Carleton University. Uh, and I want to ask uh, you, Trevor, uh, the international politics question. Uh, I guess the question is really in the context uh, of what many people are identifying as some kind of tectonic shift in the ability and power of the United States to maintain its global position. Uh, how do you see countries like South Africa uh, and others uh, responding to this uh, kind of uh, what many think, what many are describing as a kind of a decline or certainly a change in the international political balance? Thank you. And finally, Terry, I'm afraid you're going to have a double whammy here. I'm Suzanne's husband, uh, <laughs> Terry Mooney. Uh, I was surprised, Minister, at your uh, praise of the African peer review. Uh, you described it as a spur to better relations between countries. I haven't seen much of that, and specifically, I'm wondering in terms of the Kimberley process, how this is working with regard to the position of the South African government. Uh, it, it would appear that you know not only has uh, your president not been able to do much with regard to Zimbabwe, but he supported the ability of Zimbabwe to export its diamonds when the Kimberley process met last. And there are newspaper reports now that South Africa, Angola, and Namibia are getting together to allow uh, Zimbabwe to export its diamonds under cover of their own diamond shipments. I wonder if you have anything to say about that. Thank you. Great, and we'll conclude with uh, those uh, questions and Trevor's answers. So I'm afraid it's a big bunch of them. <laughs> okay, let's 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 start with Maria's question. Uh, uh, you know, we we, we uh, built in a mechanism called uh, the sun sh uh, the sunset clause. Uh, I think I think you understand on the one hand that that uh, in in a country like like Canada, for instance, it, it it would be very strange because I know before an election, uh, government executives draw up books of different colours trying to interpret the manifestos, and, so <laughs> uh, and then you have the permanence of of the public service. Uh, ours was was such a big change where you had job reservation for whites in the upper echelons of the public service, and uh, you needed uh, uh, a significant change. So managing that, I think, uh, required of us to, to 
be fairly careful. Um, this was not going to be a cataclysmic event. So we, what we were then able to negotiate was uh, uh, a sunshine clause or sunset clause allowing for for the people's pensions to be uh, to be uh, locked in, uh, and and uh, I think uh, in many instances uh, uh, the transition was was more peaceful because um, uh, executives in government felt that uh, uh, their their personal position was not going to be undermined by the nature of the change. It's one of those stories that I think has not been properly written up but probably uh, would make for a fascinating study in own name and right. Sonia, the question of the refugee status, I mean, it's a rather interesting a case from governance and, 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 and jurisprudence. You've got, a, you've got an immigration board deciding one thing. The government, uh, in other circumstances, would, would not grant uh, an immigration board the same kind of plenipotentiary powers, uh, uh, decides to, to take the matter on review. And that says, uh, that speaks volumes to the commitment of government to want uh, open and transparent processes. And then the court accepts uh, 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 that the grounds on which the status was accorded um, appeared flawed. Now, I, I don't quite know what happens from here. I don't know what kind of powers the immigration board has if the matter has to go back and, and they overturn this. But I think that, um, you know, the relations are strengthened by, by trust in systems. Uh, and that is why you can't, I don't think that you can, you can forge bilateral relations on the basis of one decision of, of, of an agency. It's how that thing pans out. It's where, it's where the reason prevails at the end and where that finds uh, 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 itself in, in a wider scheme of things that shapes relations between, between uh, states. Uh, and that certainly is, is, is the take that I would have on it. Randall, your, your question is about the shift. Now, it's, I'm saying that, like, like you know, there are, there are different contributions to this. Uh, um, Kisho Mabubani uh, at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Government in Singapore has written this wonderful book about the Asian century, and he, he argues very, very forcefully that, you know, for most of recorded history, initiative in the center of power was in the East. The last 200 years have been an aberration, and what you've got now is, is a tilt, a retilt in the balance. That's, that's one, one, one kind of view. In, in the most uh, 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 recent works by Chalmers Johnson, who passed away earlier this week, it's about the same theme, actually. It's about uh, why this notion of an empire which deals with power in a very highly asymmetric way uh, can't survive. And I think that what, you, what you're seeing in the world is the unraveling of, of a long period. Now, I'm not allowed to comment on the politics of countries, but uh, I look at the elections in some countries and you can't quite understand it. You know? <laughs> can't quite understand how people relate in the way that they do to healthcare reform can't quite understand how they relate to foreign policy, uh, but I'm not allowed to comment on this. <laughs> the, 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 problem, the problem is that, that uh, 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 the way in which a sense uh, takes root uh, in the electorate in, in all countries and the way in which we are able to resolve it. I mean, similarly, similarly I know that uh, your country might actually prefer the G7, G8 to the G20 right now. But how, how do you structure these balances? 
How do you recognize the fact that the world's second largest economy now is China? How do you bring all of those issues into play? How do you create scope for new areas of growth and development? Uh, and I think the next few years are going to be difficult because uh, it's quite unscripted. Um, and so frequently, you know, governments will tend, and or, or sometimes the electorate as well, would tend to hang on to issues with kind of white knuckles because it's the only thing they've ever known. Uh, but the world is not going to be like that. And I think that the sooner um, we, we, we can explain to people and communicate these issues, and I think that's, that's one of the big break, breakdowns. Uh, we're afraid to communicate change to people. And for me, it's a, it, it's a very difficult issue to always understand. I mean, I live in a country where democracy arrived because uniquely uh, the people who had power for so long uh, were able to communicate and take, take very tough decisions about what needed to happen. And that's what gave rise to to the negotiations. Uh, some of it was inevitable, but uh, the fact is that it happened. Uh, and, and I think the country's, the country's much, much the better for it. Uh, and if you were able to get the same thing in other countries around the world, life would be very interesting. I mean, I, I visited China just recently and, and saw the preparations for the 12th five-year plan China will be one of the first countries in the world to have a, a, a durable price for carbon because the Chinese government is preparing its people for a lower energy future. And much of the Shanghai Expo about how people will live in the future was premised on that. And I saw the best audiovisual presentation on the impact of CO2 emissions and the ravages caused by it in that expo than I've seen anywhere else. And so the issues of communication are fundamentally important. And sometimes we in government uh, think that we have all the answers and we should keep the people in the dark. Uh, I don't think that there's much room for that any longer. Now, Terry, I'm filibustering on Randall because your <laughs> questions are so hard. <laughs> now, Please, no. Uh, the minister is responding to a question. No, no, no. Please. No. And anyway, I'm afraid we're not going to be able to take any more questions. So um, L let me respond to, to, to Terry. Terry, I don't know about um, this decision. I mean, the fact that the process is called the Kimberley process is because it was born in South Africa. <laughs> you know, we are. We, uh, I mean, the fact that we haven't quite signed up to the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative is an administrative issue rather than a, a matter of principle. So on that issue, uh, I can assure you that it's work in progress. I don't know of any agreement between, between South Africa, Angola, and Namibia on the issue of, of diamonds. Uh, not, not, not knowing much about that, that, that kind of geology, um, I thought that the reason why these things, why, why something like the Kimberley process will work with diamonds is that diamonds appear to have their own unique fingerprint, kind of DNA, so you can't uh, pretend that it comes from, from somewhere else. Uh, so so it, would be, it would appear to be an exercise in futility uh, if, if, if it did arise. Um, Terry, please. <laughs> no, but, but, but in the cutting and polishing, I think that it's, it's possible to manage the relationship so that uh, you, 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 can retain, you can retain this because all of these, all of these are licensed professions. Just like the extractive industry, including diamonds, is either, you know, uh, every person for himself, and you've seen the circumstances in countries uh, like the DRC and, and Zimbabwe, uh, where, where people just get out there unlicensed, uh, 
and it begins to take the, the, the shape of blood diamonds, uh, or you have this, this, this quite ordered. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to receive the information that you have, and I'll communicate with you about it, but I, I don't know uh, uh, the detail of what you're telling me about South Africa's commitment, including uh, allowing for the sale of, of Zimbabwean diamonds. I'm happy to follow that up. Great. Well, uh, oh, our online um, mm. questioner was asking about diasporas and the diaspora role in South Africa. It was Tim. Yes, exactly. Um, you see, I want to digress from his question for a moment and, and say that there's, like, like this, this refugee issue, there's an, there's an interesting matter that appears to be unfolding uh, in my hometown of Cape Town where there was a terrible incident about a fortnight ago where a young couple uh, on honeymoon from the UK, uh, the wife was murdered. And now the husband is being brought back by the British police and there are all manner of issues relating to speculation about whether he may have had a hand in the matter. Now, when the story first broke, people who knew the situation where this happened said, no, we, we, we actually don't believe that this thing happened in this way. The policeman who drives me at home said, no, I don't believe that this happened in this way. And I was, I was quite taken aback. And you'll see that as this matter unfolds, uh, local knowledge is actually fundamentally important. And so one of the things that the diaspora must do is to be able to familiarize themselves with the issues. And, and people in the diaspora are, are, in my view, frequently in two camps. There are those who left for whatever reason and still feel a very strong bond of affinity and want to help and will help and will use their local knowledge to persuade others to join them in ventures in the country. That's the one group. There's another group who actually frequently find difficulty in justifying to themselves why they left. And sometimes they're angry with themselves about having left. And sometimes that anger becomes the dominant emotion when they express themselves about the country. Now, you know, I want to I want to talk to the first group. I don't want to recognize the others for now. Um, and and I think that there's a there's a there's a formidably important role, which brings local knowledge to bear. And it's not just local knowledge about a time that you left uh, 30 years ago. It's about a network of people who can actually assist others navigate their way into countries that from thousands and thousands of kilometers away looks very different. And the problem, of course, is that if you rely on uh, cable network news services to be the only source of information, you'll never actually uh, feel the dynamism of a country in the process of change. Because uh, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. I mean, there's no other point in, in running these, these global uh, systems. There's, there's no space to deal with, with the real issues of change. And so uh, I, I want to appeal through Tim uh, to others to, to see that as an enormous opportunity to continue contributing uh, to, to development in our country. Thank Terrific. And, and that was very much the spirit of his question as I read it. Uh, in concluding, I'd like to recognize in our midst uh, Senator Siegel, who's a great friend of IDRC and also, I think, a great friend of South Africa. And above all, Trevor, we want to thank you. It was a wonderful experience for all of us learning from you. Many thanks. Thank you.